Okay, thanks for uh, clicking play there. We are joined today by David DeRozier, who is one, a great guy, and two, uh, the president of the Real Clear Foundation. Do I say the Real Clear Foundation or is it just Real Clear Foundation? Um, whatever you choose. Mike. Okay, good. I, I like the the. Uh, before, you're, like, you're, I mean, you're a definite article, Mike. You yeah, definitely. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and before coming to what I'll now just call for short, Real Clear, uh, David was executive vice president of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, now, how long? Oh, did, was there another job in the middle there? No, no, there was. Okay. I was just remembering how young I was when I was at the Manhattan yeah. Institute. Yeah. And how long? I, how long I, have you been I, at Real Clear? I've been at Real Clear. I think I left right before the the bottom of the economy fell out in 2006, 2007. A perfect time to actually join an internet startup. Yeah. Yeah. So where is home, David? I mean, home physically right now is uh, Palm Beach, uh, Florida. Where were you uh, born? Where was home originally? Oh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Oh, that's right. Okay. And, I mean, and if your viewers have any any difficulties with me, it's primarily for, from the place of my origin. I've done my best since then, but I do how, love the place. How does a Worcesterite end up at the Manhattan Institute and then uh, real clear? A great teacher a great teacher. Um, you know, I, if I had to describe myself kind of growing up, I would, I was a rebel without a clue. Right. And I, I just happened to actually go to a small Catholic great book school, Assumption College. I think it's called Assumption University now, so we can get the branding right. Now, are you and, putting the quotes around Assumption or University or both? Well, you, you could, in principle, you could do both, but no. Okay. Uh, unlike most places, uh, I, I, you, if you went to Assumption at the time that I went to and you studied with the teachers that I had, you received probably one of the best liberal arts educations in America. So I would say that the reason I am who I am, I'm where I am, is the, is the byproduct of a few teachers, one in particular, right? I just came of age there. It kind of opened my mind. And because of that, I'm where I am. I think you should feel free to name that teacher. Uh, oh, oh, the teacher's name is uh, uh, Dan Mahoney. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, he, and again, if you want to talk about one of the problems of higher education is that it took somebody who should have been at the top of the food chain teaching elsewhere. And it, and it put it in my hometown of Worcester, Massachusetts. And this guy is, was, is, is still remains, I think, one of the standout political scientists of, of his generation. And, and I hope for this moment, you know, yeah. because we're tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, did you go right from Assumption to Manhattan or were there some, was, were there some lost years? Oh, no. oh, definitely. There was some beautiful lost years. I mean, one of them, I, you know, it, you know, so you graduate, you know, from college thinking that's the only education one ought to get or deserve. And then, he threw me off to graduate school where I got my PhD in political science at Fordham University. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then Manhattan and then real clear. Oh no, there was one other place in between there. Um, so uh, there was also, a, 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 there's a think tank called the Claremont Institute. I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But so uh, they have this uh, fellowship program. Right, you know, called the Publius Fellows uh, Program. At that time, they have a number of programs, and you know what they try to do is, you know, they're intellectual stock pickers. They they look at people who are out there that are publicly spirited, talented, want to do something, you know, for the sake of their country, and then they bring them out and give them a little bit of a finishing school, right? You know, and and while I was at one of those finishing schools, the then president of the place, Larry Arn, offered me my first job which is a very good thing to get, particularly when you asked a woman to marry you and you were not yet employed. Mm -hmm. So I worked for two years at the Claremont Institute before uh, making my way back uh, to New York and working at uh, the Manhattan Institute where I, I did, I, I think, a solid decade of time there, yeah. right? And that was right during the time when kind of New York was being transformed by the Manhattan Institute's ideas and went from the city that was characteristic of, you know, bonfires of the vanities, right? You know, the, you know, the Manhattan Institute's ideas and the leadership of Rudy Giuliani put out the bonfire, 
right? And, you know, during that tenure, I, I mean, it was, a, it was a nice education for me about really the power of ideas. You know, uh, everybody in the, in the movement likes to say ideas have consequences. Well, I can tell you they do, right? You know, they're, they're, that they can change things. And when you move away from them, I think you see what, you know, Mayor Adams is going under now. It's like, you know, that the bonfire comes back. But the good news is, is the recipe for putting it out has been well established and hopefully with a return to people to work and to their sense, New York City can become the city that it once was, or at least a, at least a, some approximation of it. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to real clear, uh, David, I think many people watching or, you know, reading a summary of this will be familiar with real clear politics. I hope so. Real Clear is, in fact, a suite of sites, which we may discuss uh, in a minute. I suppose I should disclose that on one of those, uh, uh, one feed, there's a Real Clear policy that's part of Real Clear politics, and I help curate uh, the philanthropy and giving section of Real Clear policy. Uh, so I just want to mention that. Uh, but then but tell me. But as an absentee landlord, Mike, are you doing a good job? I am doing a great job. I'm giving myself a 10 out of 10 and A+. Plus. Uh, All right. Then there is a real clear foundation. What is the relationship between uh, the foundation and, and, and real clear politics? What, what, what does it do and how? I mean, the reason why I left the Manhattan Institute and went over to real clear is because, you know, the Man real clear built something that everybody who was talking about the future of the internet said wasn't possible. They pretty much said that the world was going to just create these little digital tribes and these digital cul-de-sacs and we would have a bifurcated conversation and there would be no middle there would be no one place where everybody could come together you know whether it's yeah, you know it's the drinking pool or the water fountain you know you can go serengeti or to the office but it was just there was not going to be a shared place where people you know could could kind of go and see what other people were saying and you know, I had, when I first recognized the uh, real clear politics, you know, they kind of came out in 2000. You know, I joined them later in 2006. I can't call myself an early adopter in terms of employee, but it's like, I, I, I looked at the site and I just was, you know, they created a conversation where prior to their existence, there was a, mon a monologue. So they made a dialogue where there was a monologue. And as a person who, who thought that the only way that a free people remains free is by having a conversation. You know, I wanted to be there, right? Um, and I kind of discovered real clear, you know, quite accidentally, where one of my colleagues at the Manhattan Institute, Brian Anderson, who's the publisher of uh, City Journal, a must read and must support for all philanthropists out there. He, uh, he had a book called The New New Media, which now after 16, you know, after 16 years later, it's kind of, I feel kind of old and I think the media feels a little bit older, but it was just, it talked about this place real clear. And I had a dinner for uh, Brian to promote his book and I brought John McIntyre, one of the founders of it. And then, you know, after that we had a drink and then, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, I was going to something that I thought was such a public good, you know? So I, I mean, my own, uh, you know, my own attachment and my kind of movement towards there, is I saw something that wasn't supposed to exist, a unicorn. And I just wanted to go and, and support that effort. And part of the way that we support that effort is through the foundation. Um, because I don't know, it's like people describe like real clear and other internet you know, news organizations as the, you know, the asteroid that came down to earth and destroyed you know, kind of the ecosystem of journalism. I have to tell you, it's not good for us either. It's a very, you know, it's a very hard business to tell, you know, the truth, that, you know, in a world that monetizes itself by CPMs and click through rates, right? So I always thought that, you know, Real Clear deserved a better foundation for its work, you know, in large part because, you know, Real Clear is not liked by either sides in a sense, like, you know, it's like, you're not conservative, you're not, you know, you're not progressive or liberal. Right. And it's like the one thing that people can agree is they don't like the lukewarm. But what we wanted to do is kind of create a dialogue to actually show that, you know, people are actually spitting things at each other that are hot and real. 
And, but it's like, this is a better kind of way to kind of curate that, to see that. And, but with the foundation, you know, I thought we could do more. I thought the circumstances deserved more and through it, we've been able to do more. Uh, as we finish up with part one to get to part two and talk about what I'm gonna call nonprofit journalism, tell us what a CPM is, David. A click through per thousand. Oh. Yeah, uh, so to give you a sense about how bad the world is, once upon a time, there were these little newsies, kids that stood outside and said, extra, extra, read all about it. And the headline sold the whole, the whole paper, yeah. right? Now we live in a world where the newsies are selling one article at a time. And, you know, and if you, if a thousand people read them, you'll get a rate based on that. And I had to tell you, it's a no, it's a rate that doesn't support journalism, right? It doesn't support the truth, right? And it doesn't support the type of long form investigations, the type of, like the reason why I think, you know, media has a protection is because it has a job. It's supposed to be the Lipitor for the body politics. It's supposed to go after demosclerosis. Like it's supposed to go and look where you're not supposed to look. And because it's looking where it's not a good place to look, they need to be protected. And I, I do think, well, I would say that the future of media is in a hybrid, like, you know, a little bit of mix between chasing your CPMs and also finding people who will put their money where your mind is. And that's an important distinction. You know, the whole goal in life is to find people who actually agree with your mission and actually allow you to do your work, right? And that's philanthropy at its best, you know? And I think that's characteristic of the uh, philanthropy that we've aimed to find. And I think it's probably characteristic of the philanthropy that's out there for most part. For the most part, people find people who kind of share their mission and want to accelerate it and make it happen by putting their money behind it. Right. So when people usually talk about who funds you, it seems to me to be like a, a fool's errand who who only purpose is is not to try to understand that news authority, that person, that institution on their own terms. And I think that's probably another contributing factor to why, you know, our discourse has gotten so messed up. OK, why don't we end part one there and uh, pick up with part two in a bit here, David.